Okay, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Green Financial Solutions for you and me. Um, I'm Amy Cortez with Impact Alpha. We're a news site and newsletter that covers the impact investing world. Um, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I wrote a book about local investing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, after the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and, you know, the, the impetus was, uh, you know, Wall Street nearly took down the global economy and main streets were hurting, communities were hurting, but Wall Street quickly bounced back. So people were asking, how can I invest in my own community and in Main Street instead of Wall Street? Well, the fact was, it was not easy to do. Um, there were not a lot of options at the time um, for the average person or the, the retail investor, the you and me in the title. Um, so I don't want to get into securities laws, but basically that's because retail investors are um, more constrained in what they can invest in uh, because regulators care about investor protection. So today, as we know, climate is the, the pressing issue, um, and it can be just as hard, if not harder, to find green investment options that not only are making a difference, but are um, uh, you know, not just screening out the bad stuff. So green investments you can feel good about, but are truly meaningful. So I'm excited about our panel today. Um, we have a great lineup. But before we dive in, uh, can we do a show of hands here? How many people have invested in green, climate-friendly investment products? OK, fair, fair amount. You're in the right place. <laughs> and how many want to invest in green, climate-friendly investment products? OK. So we've, we've got a gap there, and you have come to the right place. Um, so our panelists represent a wide range of offerings, from banking products and mutual funds to green crowdfunding and educational tools. So there's really something for everybody here. And our, our hope is that you leave today not just inspired to um, take action, but with also some good investment ideas to help you do so. So I think you're in for a lively discussion. Um, I'm gonna ask our panel to briefly introduce themselves, um, their organizations, and we're gonna start um, kind of from the more basic products to the slightly more um, sophisticated, for lack of a better word. Um, so we're gonna start with Lauren here um, at um, Climate First Bank. So we weren't doing tallest to shortest, was that? <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Dubay. I work for Climate First Bank. We are the uh, nation's first FDIC insured community bank that was founded off of how to sequester and uh, draw down atmospheric CO2. So we do a lot of, I would say, the low hanging fruit of residential solar, um, but also getting into how do we incentivize commercial real estate owners and business owners to make those right decisions by offering discounts on loans and uh, different fee structures. But we're a, a net zero banking alliance member, meaning we've committed our loan and investment portfolio to net zero by 2050. Um, we're a 1% for the planet member, where we give 1% of our gross revenues to environmental partners um, through 1% for the planet every year, as well as a pending certified B Corp. So we really try to make sure that our mission um, is really ingrained in everything that we do. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background and how you came here? And I know you've done some work in Treasury, right? I have. Um, so I, I've been in the values line banking space for almost a decade, most of my banking career. So I started at a small uh, bank in Florida that eventually sold and then spent five years out in California working for a similar banking model there. Um, but in that time, I. I worked as a client and treasury manager at a bank in California where you know you really just start to learn the um, the deep impacts of just our deposit dollars. Tom um, Steyer's bank, right? Yes, Tom Steyer's bank. <laughs> um, well, he was the founder of the bank, but no longer affiliated with the bank. Um, but the real impact of deposit dollars, so um, I'm going to make sure I say this right, but if anybody's read the carbon bankroll report on corporate cash emissions, um, just to give you kind of a sense of the impact of deposit dollars, 
Um, so in 2021, PayPal's financial footprint was 55 times larger than the company's cumulative emissions, scope one, two, and three. So that means that at that current emissions rate, it would take until the year 2076 for PayPal to generate the cumulative emissions that that company's cash investments did in just 2021. Um, you also have companies like Microsoft and Apple that um, are at three, a little over three times the um, amount of financed emissions from their cash and investment portfolio, meaning it would take um, every Apple and Microsoft product device in the world. Um, that's their, the climate um, finance emissions is three times that use. So I know everybody in this room, I'm sure, has a deposit account. So I would that's kind of the lens I'm, I'm bringing to this panel. Yeah, just to um, underscore that deposits matter, and especially for corporations, but also for all of us collectively. Um, James, you're up. Hey, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm James Regulinski. I'm one of the co-founders at Carbon Collective. We are an investment advisor, and we focus on making climate forward portfolios for individuals, but also for companies that have 401ks. So most of the money that we save as individuals for retirement is in either 401ks and then in IRAs. So that accounts for about $15 trillion in the USA. Um, and we're trying to help bridge that financial gap. So we know the technologies we need to be investing in if we're going to solve the climate crisis. Um, but we need to be investing about $5 trillion more every year than we're currently investing. So this is a problem that we can solve only by building our way out of it, unlike other problems that we have. Um, <clears throat> and we know the cost of inaction, and we know what it takes to get us there. So we built, um, as I said, individual products that divest you from fossil fuels, proactively invest you in climate solutions. So these are companies that get most of their revenue from one of the technologies that's been identified by Project Drawdown or the International Energy Association. And then we put additional shareholder pressure. So your deposit money, that sort of debt, finances a lot of projects and things you do, but also your investment dollars, this is the equity you own in companies, has a voice. <clears throat> and you can use it both through opportunity cost, proactively in helping the companies that are making a difference, and in the vote you have as a shareholder. So we bring those all together and um, help you make a little more impact with your money. Great. Franz. Uh, w wonderful. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Franz Hochstrasser. I am the CEO and co-founder of Raise Green, the climate investment platform. Uh, we are an SEC and FINRA registered marketplace, and we sell private securities. Uh, so the other side of the coin uh, from what James does uh, into early stage climate tech companies, as well as individual project companies themselves. So. Every time uh, you see a commercial scale or utility scale uh, renewable energy project, that is very typically owned by one uh, small purpose, uh, special purpose vehicle. And we work with the developers of those projects to sell fractional ownership, uh, both equity and also debt, uh, to raise money and make those projects happen. Uh, and then we also work with climate tech companies raising pre-seed rounds or seed rounds um, to uh, help them lever up. So we've worked with Block Power to raise about $3 million, um, and they've now gone on to raise $150 million um, just recently. Um, and then uh, we've also worked with the Connecticut Green Bank, for example, um, to issue a debt product uh, that lets individuals invest as little as $100 uh, to uh, to own a piece of uh, energy efficiency portfolio. So, um, you know, we, we come at this problem with the idea that 85% of individual investors in the U.S. and a full 99% of millennials, according to Morgan Stanley, uh, want more sustainable investment options. So the half of the room that raised their hand that said, hey, I, I want in, uh, you know, y'all are among that group. And we want to provide an opportunity for you to allocate that capital into inefficient markets, private markets, where uh, it's difficult for early stage uh, entrepreneurs to get capital. Um, it's difficult for um, institutions uh, to mobilize uh, capital at a rate that is competitive sometimes. Um, and so uh, we structure those securities offerings. We make them available to anyone and everyone. Uh, and also, I will mention, 
Uh, we just kicked off our own crowd investment raise uh, to put our equity where our values are. Uh, so any of you all who are interested, uh, you can actually uh, buy into our company directly for as little as $100 now as well. So really excited to be here for the conversation. Great, fantastic. And last but not least, um, Trenton Allen. And um, Trenton, I love your site, so I I'm, you know, can't wait for you to tell everybody about it. Got it. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Trenton Allen, uh, CEO of Ask Sustainable. Uh, so, so when Amy asked the question earlier of, um, are you investors who are investing in sort of climate friendly or green products? And then she asked a question about those other half that might be interested in, I would say our platform as sustainable is a place where you can go to find the full range of climate friendly investment products. So as sustainable was developed uh, really well, the mindset of it's really hard to know where all the potential climate friendly investment products are, financial products are, let's not say investment financial products are. And so we wanted to do the work. Uh, we were received a grant from the Hewlett Foundation to launch this particular platform to really bring together information such that it makes it easier for you, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues, your companies to find information around what are the available options related to climate friendly financial products. And so on our particular platform, we launched in uh, November of uh, 2022. And on our platform right now, we have deposit products. So that's your checking, saving CDs, money markets. Climate First Bank is one of the products that is on, one of our product providers. Glad to have uh, them on there. We also have other impact note products. Think of non-FDIC insured products from CDFIs or credit unions. Those are the types of products that are there. We have a range of them. And then we also have currently ETFs, um, exchange traded funds on our particular platform. And glad that as of Friday, James and Carbon Collective are on our platform and you could visit them, visit a profile about them there. And from day one, we've had Raise Green as one of our partners. And so really what we've been trying to do is just be a hub for information around climate friendly financial products um, to make to allow people to understand what's in some of these products, where are the proceeds going, how much CO2 emissions might be there, to give you a sense of sort of how you might evaluate one product versus another, as well as to better understand what is out there and available. Because there's so much, as many of us know in this particular room, um, that there's a lot of things that say we're green, but you're trying to figure out sort of what's the impact truly of the dollars that we're spending. That's why we created this particular platform. Um, I've been in banking and finance my entire career um, and really excited about this because I think it connects the work that I used to do in project finance and how do we execute solar projects and wind farms and biomass into thinking about sort of how do we aggregate and accelerate the deployment of capital um, that is so much more abundant than some of the other sources we think about from government to be able to make a real change. So excited to um, join this particular panel and excited for the conversation. Great, thank you. And yeah, I discovered a lot of things on your site that I was not aware of, and I, I do um, keep track of these things. So um, before we move on to our Q&A period, my panel has asked me to um, mention that this panel does not constitute financial advice. <laughs> that goes for all of them. Um, so um, I, I wanted to start with a question about ESG, which is kind of the elephant in the room. And here we are in Florida. There's a certain governor who has made ESG, environmental, social, and governance, his you know, boogeyman or his jihad. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, to me, it, it's just insane. Uh, to me, um, ESG is simply risk management, and it's looking at a particular company. And it really, it's not about, you know, what your product even does. That would be impact investing. And some of the solutions I think we're talking about here that um, actually are making an impact on the broader you know, system, um, there are, you know, uh, solutions that create systemic change. Um, so I'm interested in the panel's thoughts here. Um, 
do you consider yourselves ESG? Is this backlash hurting your efforts? Like, what do you make of this whole crazy thing? Um, we're most squarely in the crosshairs and in the space of ESG, so I'll start. Um, the first thing is we did not consider ourselves an ESG. We were trying to go beyond ESG. Um, and if you look at the history of sort of impact investing, there have been a bunch of terms we've used to talk about different parts. So there's been impact investing, socially responsible investing, ESG, climate forward or climate focused investing, and a lot more. And all of those are looking at what besides returns, by, besides like economic dollar returns, do our investors care about and how might we represent those things? Um, ESG is where a lot of us landed and from the consumer perspective, a lot of folks think of, a lot of the folks I talk to every day, think of ESG as when I put my money in this, it will do good in the world. My money in equals good out. The reality is where Wall Street ended up with ESG is how do I manage the risk of a changing climate or social justice, social justice issues or the governance of a company creating financial risks for me. So it's a way of translating some elements of social issues into a risk score that they can then take and crunch in when they look at all the other risks that a company might have and make a decision about whether to invest in it or not. So there's actually a disconnect between like where Wall Street thinks about ESG and where most consumers think about ESG. Um, so we didn't think of ourselves as an ESG company because we weren't looking at just the risk element. Um, Carbon Collective cares a lot about the uh, how we change the world we live in to be the world we want to live in. So how do we get from where we are today to that transition in which we do have, we aren't reliant on fossil fuels, where we do have cleaner air, where we are, you know, not as reliant as, ex or not at all reliant on extractive industries. Um, and that question, that vision resonates more with what I think a lot of retail investors are looking for when they talk about um, wanting to invest their money responsibly. I'm saving for retirement. I want to retire into a world that is a better world to live in. So um, I, when I say, when we talk about this like crosshairs of how politicized ESG is and how people are trying to regulate and control it, it's like not even the mark in the stand that I want to be fighting over. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is the one that we happen to be in, but it's not the one we want to fight over. However, it is important because that data about tracking companies is forcing companies to think differently about how they behave. Um, so to some degree, we are more regulated both from the SEC standpoint and now on local sides. Um, on our 401k business, there's been a law, I don't want to go too deep into this, but there's been a, regulations from the Department of Labor um, that have been flip-flopping back and forth around this. There have been, um, there's a bill currently that was passed uh, around what you can, what a financial advisor can do for 401ks in particular. So all of those end up shifting what we can do, but what the whole industry can do, and so a lot of folks are scared to do more. So that's my, my initial take, and I'll leave it over. Yeah, I would jump in here and just say, um, you know, backing up and, and pulling apart what, what it is exactly we're discussing with, with environmental, social, and governance information. It is data, and, in, and more information about how certain companies are measuring, uh, setting goals, and going about meeting those goals. And the idea of uh, excluding data from an investor's decision uh, is, is very anathema to uh, free market principles, which you know, the, many of those lodging complaints from the right um, actually uh, profess to stand for. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very uh, fascinating hill to die on in, in their case, um, and one that I think is, is misguided personally, but um, professionally, yes, you know, Raise Green is also squarely in the environmental, social, and governance uh, screen. So we use that type of data. We look at uh, we, we use the raise model to assess whether to put a company on our marketplace. Uh, that evaluates whether that company can produce revenue. Uh, it evaluates the ambition as, as well as the experience of the team, uh, the impact that's likely to come about if that project or company is successful. And then uh, that's both a social and environmental impact that we're looking at. Um, so yes, we use environmental, social, and governance data to assess the the types of investments that we offer. Um, but let's not confuse that with an investment strategy, uh, which is, you know, are you investing for impact or are you investing for return? Um, what is your risk and return threshold? 
and how are you de making decisions around uh, how you personally uh, want to uh, vote with your dollars, um, which is you know informed by ESG data and information. And I, I want to add just one quick thing because I noticed you said, are you investing for impact or for returns? And it has been a really long held statement in the industry that you can only have one or the other, that you don't get to have good returns if you invest in an impactful way. And I think you've noticed in your work, um, and I've seen in the, some of the companies that you can invest in and raise green, that that is not in necessarily true. Well, I'm going to see you and raise you one on that one. <laughs> Actually, I think no matter where your dollars are, it is having an impact. And that is the central premise of why we built As Sustainable, is that wherever it's at, whether it's with Climate First Bank, whether it's with Carbon Collective, whether it's through companies or projects that are on Raise Green, it is having an impact. The question becomes, what's the impact? what impact do you want for the dollars that you have control over? And I sort of believe that many people would like to have the dollars that they have control of to have a positive impact for our climate. And that is essentially what our definition of climate friendly is. is are the proceeds of the dollars that are being managed or invested, does it have a positive impact on the climate? Can we see a direct line through the dollars, impact, and investments? And if so, we call that climate friendly, and that's what's on our particular platform. So we don't really try to get too bogged down in this question about whether it's ESG or not ESG, because I think ESG is measuring something differently than what we're actually measuring. We want to be able to have that if we have Salima here wants to invest, she knows that what she sees on a platform are places where we've been able to at least track to the best of our ability that those dollars are being used for the benefit of climate. Now, how much is it? There's a varied approach about sort of how much it, are they planting trees? Are they actually investing in solar projects? Are they doing some other types of things? There could be a wide range of that. But the idea that these dollars are having an impact, we need to be able to identify. And so for us, we tried to get out of the conversation about ESG conversations about greenwashing, because I think that in, leads us to a place where we are um, fighting a battle that we don't need to fight. I think we all want to have some impact to the dollars that we have, and it also lets people off the hook for the impact of the dollars that are currently already invested in the system. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that we recognize that your dollars are having impact, what impact do you want them to have? And I'll just say just two things. And so we looked at this from a data standpoint, and we did a look back at the end of uh, last year, one of the things we looked at was if we looked at deposit products. If we looked at climate-friendly deposit products versus the market, climate-friendly deposit products were outperforming two times yeah. in return the other products. Climate-friendly products, two times the other products. ETFs on par with the market. And so this argument that basically I need to choose is misguided in some respects. And so what we're trying to do is produce the data that can arm people with the information to say, no, there are places where you can go where you're not really in choosing the environment. What you're saying is like, I want to be direct and intentional about the impact that I'm having for my dollars, and I'm going to find investments where I can make that true. And I think um, to that point, Franz, I think it was you um, at lunch, we're talking about a study, I mean, by not, you know, if this crazy banning ESG um, can actually cost um, a lot of money, can cost investors a lot of money. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this, this is a study by a watchdog in the state of Indiana where they're considering uh, a rule that, that bans ESG considerations for their pension plans. And it found that uh, if, in fact, they, they did go ahead and prevented the money managers from utilizing ESG information to make decisions for the, their pension investments, it would cost them uh, about $6.7 billion in potential profits uh, by, by putting that in place. So that was the stat. I mean, the energy transition has been called the greatest wealth, genera wealth generating um, uh, opportunity in our lifetime. So it does seem kind of crazy to you know cut that off. Um, did you have any comments or, or on, on the ESG? No, I think Trenton got me. <laughs> no, I mean, but like that's something that gets brought up a lot in terms of investing and, and isn't really thought of in terms of just your standard banking products a lot. But 
I think you said it well, like the money you put in, is it doing good? That's really the, the bottom line. And, you know, we're starting to figure out how we track that as a bank, whether, whether it's through how we measure the um, emissions of our whole loan portfolio, um, how we treat our staff and the jobs that we generate in our communities, um, are our products fair and transparent? Um, so those are the things that, that we look for at a bank that we report on because we want our deposit base to feel like not only is it climate friendly, but mm -hmm. is it community friendly? Um, is it is it doing good and for your value set, um, which you know typically goes beyond climate? I think we all kind of say that we're big climate activists, or we wouldn't be in this room. But I'm sure there's a lot of other people that would say that they also have a lot of other um, values that are close to their heart, whether it's women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and then those are the things that that we try to platform as well. Um, so, what you're, what you're putting in is it doing good? I mean, I I just you said that really well, James. Lauren, can I actually build off something you said earlier, which I think really, I just want to drive home how important, especially as we're talking more about investments, but how important your your uh, banking is. In that same bankroll report, when you were talking about the multiples, um, if you look at Apple's sustainability report, and this one really just stuck out with me, that more of their impact came from their investments than all of their manufacturing and sales and scope three wow. emissions. Um, and they just sort of ignored that. Uh, when they looked at their plan of how to get to net zero. And I think a lot of us kind of do the same. We put our money away and it's kind of invisible. It's that safety net. We need it. Like, how are we going to retire without our money? Like, how are we going to be able to live our lives? We need this safety net. And we sort of segment it off in our brains. We're like, oh, I'm going to drive an electric car. I'm going to bike. I'm going to bring my reusable bags to the grocery store. These are all laudable things. But then we leave this massive piece of our life where we're just like, we'll just trust the system that has been causing all this problems to manage our money and they'll do it in a way that's like, it, it won't be a problem, it's not the big thing to do. But you, you make this change once, you move over to Climate First Bank, you change how you invest your money, like that is one of the biggest things you can do. And once you've done it, you can just go on doing the other great work that everyone in this room is doing. You don't have to think about it again. Well, and Franz, to your point, um, again at lunch, um, you were talking about the need for financial literacy. Mm. And Trenton, you have that great educational component of, you, of your website. So I think that's important, right? Like, none of us learn this. If you're not an investment professional, it can just be really hard to find this stuff and figure out what you can invest in. And um, so um, all of that is, is very important. So one other. Um, topic I want to touch on before we jump into some more nitty gritty, um, kind of parallel to ESG is the big issue of greenwashing. Um, greenwashing is real. Um, there, we, we at Impact Alpha, we track this um, US Sustainable Investment Forum. Every two years, they come out with a tally of um, sustainable investments. So um, it was 17 trillion in 2020, last year, it was 8.4 trillion. So where did half of those sustainable investment funds go? Well, I think um, fund managers, you know, everybody's getting slammed for greenwashing and there are regulations coming as has happened in Europe and they're coming here. So um, fund managers are being much more careful about what they call sustainable or ESG or impact. And that just, you know, gives you a measure of how much that was like half of, you know, 8.7 trillion that was not really ESG or sustainable. So um, it is real and, and actually that's progress to start weeding out um, that kind of stuff. But how do how do you all um, you know, stand apart, differentiate yourself, and not get, you know, m let people know because there's a lot of like confusion and mistrust. So, how do you let people know that you are the real deal? Uh, we refer people to Ask Sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, actually, in fact, uh, we we've utilized a lot of their uh, primary work to derive some of the impact metrics. Um, and and carbon emission reduction metrics off of our pla off of our projects. So, I'm not joking, <laughs> um, but you know, gr greenwashing is is pernicious. The the thought of you know is is something solely a marketing claim versus is it backed up by uh, implementation and, and data? Um, and you know, I I go back to a paper I read in grad school that actually was one of the catalysts for me personally to found Raise Green, 
Uh, and that was, it's called Beyond Returns. It's done by uh, University of Geneva, um, Private Wealth. It's a research paper. Basically, they, they found that there are, there are two uh, real ways to have genuine impact with your money. Uh, one was owning shares in publicly traded companies uh, and voting your shares, you know, being, being an active shareholder. Um, and the other was allocating capital into inefficient markets places where it's, it's needed and it's, it's difficult to get. Um, and, and that has been sort of the, the core drive and motivation of Raise Green. Um, and as we look at um, you know, public equities kind of uh, flowing into uh, you know, different labeled funds here and there across uh, the, you know, the, the publicly traded uh, spectrum of, of money management, um, you know that that is kind of a guiding force for me. Is 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 this is this funding uh, that and, and and are the are these companies uh, you know tracking? Are they setting targets for for climate? Are they tracking their targets? Um, and are they reporting on them uh, in a meaningful way? Um, and then you know are the money managers who are bundling those and into exchange traded funds or or mutual funds? Um, holding them to account for that. So we're a member of the uh, Partnership for Carbon Accounting and Financials, um, which uh, is man many of the, the large m money managers are also for, uh, members of that. And Climate First. Awesome. It's hard, though. <laughs> it is hard. It's, it's not easy to do the calculations. Um, but but I, I think there are there are some telltale ways to, to find out uh, whether you know what you're doing, or wh what you're putting your money into, is uh, is genuine or not. So we took a very different approach. I love the data-driven approach, and I think there's a lot of power to that. Um, we took a what needs. Uh, I don't want to call it quite a storytelling approach, but we took a like what needs that. What's the outcome we're trying to achieve in all of this, and then what are the mechanisms to get to that outcome? So. If in like the classic, and this is not what you were saying, but in the classic ESG, we look at the data, we look at the numbers, and we can say this company is less bad than that company. But we're not going to less bad our way to a solution. We're not going to say like I am, I am the, you know, I am the least harmful of the oil producing companies, and therefore you should invest in me because I have the best ESG score. Um, so when you're looking at particularly your retirement accounts, which is the kind of thing that we deal with, and you have more limits in terms of what you can invest in. Period. Uh, we said, what are the companies that are creating proactive change? Well, we, we said two things. We said, what is the path to get here? We know you can't invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure. And we know that there's a bunch of technologies across the spectrum. This is uh, energy production, transportation, uh, energy infrastructure, a built environment, circular economy. Um, all of these technologies, we need to expand drama dramatically. So we know what we can't be investing in. We know what we need to be investing in. And as you pointed out, we know how we need to be pressuring companies. We know that our votes matter on that. So that is, for us, how we decide around what companies need to be invested in. We think that there has historically been, and this will change as regulation comes and it becomes fraudulent to make claims in your ESG reports that aren't factually true and you don't have clear accounting. That's really hard to do. Um, but historically, CEOs would literally tell people in their companies, hey, massage the numbers till our ESG scores look better. Like that was common practice. The ESG wasn't regulated. It was something that was done for PR. So it was not uncommon to have both wildly different methodologies from, a, from figuring out what your score should be. And then on top of that, having that information be hard to trust. So we look at the other data that is regulated. What are their earnings from? Where are they making money? So to get into our climate solutions fund, a company needs to be making over 50% of its money from one of the identified solutions. And that's not something you lie as easily about. It's not something you can say, hey, we've made a commitment to net zero in 20, 30 after I've retired, our company will definitely absolutely be doing the things that we say we're going to be doing, which you know might be true, but it also might not be. They might fail to hit those requirements. And so if they are part of the transition, part of the work that we know needs to be done, then they are making those products and selling those products. So that was, how, that was our approach, which is a little different than a lot of what you see on in the industry, but we wanted something that is clear to understand. If it is 
highly technical, it is hard for the average person to double check the work. It becomes necessary, and this is like incredibly important work you're doing, Trinan. It's like it becomes necessary to dig through highly technical things to then assess whether greenwashing or whether they, whether the theory of change this, this fund has or this company has aligns with yours. And we think every financial, I mean, we're biased because this is what we did, but we think every financial advisor and every company should essentially say, this is our theory of change, this is what we believe. You might not agree with us, mm -hmm. but this is, this is it, and you can check our work, so. Um, and the good news is there are that many publicly traded companies that meet that threshold of revenue materiality for climate solutions of 50% or more. Um, how many in your, your index? Yeah, so we, we have about 200. That number goes up and down, though, depending yeah. on <laughs> companies coming off the market, market or coming on the market, going public, or changing what they're doing. So. And another thing with banks, um, a good measure to look at or um, you know, factor to look at is the alliance you're a member of, and I always forget the name. There, I mean, there's a lot. Like we call like the bottom of our website like acronym soup because we've just <laughs> while, while I really like we were talking about how much we really have a hard time with like pledges and commitments because of what you just said like it's really easy to say that you're going to commit to something that you're probably going to retire or not be around before it actually happens like saying that you're going to be net zero by 2050 but I mean we signed up for so many pledges and commitments so that we had that many different accountability partners um like with Net Zero Banking Alliance, we're like, okay, well, that's that's a goal for us to be able to, to get to our uh, and crash an investment portfolio by, or loan an investment portfolio by 2050. That's why we signed on to PCAF. It's like, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we have to know where we're going to start. Um, so they gave us the framework for how we're actually going to calculate the emissions of every single asset class of our loan portfolio. That's why we signed on to B Corp, because what better way to me measure how we're working operationally, how we're treating our, our communities and our, our workers and, of course, the planet. So, we, I mean, we signed on to a lot of pledges, but every year we report on our progress with those pledges. Like, Trenton first asked me, he's like, well, do you have the emissions of your loan portfolio? And I was like, nope, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work. And, and every year we report on that progress so that we just incrementally just get better and better, just keeping one foot in front of the other. So we're actually about to give you the, the calculations of our, our mortgage and our commercial real estate portfolio, which is small. We're a small bank, but I mean, it took a lot of work, and uh, but we're there. And that's a, a progress that we're able to report on. Um, great. So um, each of you um, represent a, a relatively small entity compared with some of the giant financial institutions that we're all familiar with. Um, how do you, um, how are you different from the big names that, you know, offer um, sustainable finance products or, or claim to offer in some um, uh, respects? And um, are there any financial trade-offs for investors in going with a smaller firm versus like a, you know, giant like Bank of America sort of outfit? So I'll go first. We are 100% free. All right, so AskSustainable.com, that's where you can go, is all free. Uh, we believe that basically if we're really going to have uh, acceleration of dollars for the benefit of our climate, that access to information, access to the same information, can't be held behind a firewall where people need to pay for it. If we really want more people to invest climate first, know about Carbon Collective, know about all these different products, we can't make our money there. We'll find other ways to do it, and we've been fortunate enough to have some foundations who have been able to fund us. But we start with that premise that basically this information is yours, um, and we need you to have this, be armed with this information so you can make the very best choices around what risk profile, uh, what type of return, what type of impact do you want to have with your particular dollars? And so for us, it, it is, you know, we'll at some point in time have to figure out sort of how we continue to provide these types of services. But for us, it is key that this information is there. In order for financial markets to work, there must be trust and there must be transparency. Mm -hmm. And particularly around the climate space, there's some trust. <laughs> there's not a whole lot of transparency. And so I applaud Lauren and the work that they're doing to do the really hard work of finding this data related to carbon, because it's helpful for us to tell the story of what their product is doing so that you can have a better opportunity to compare what they're doing with others that are out there and say, I want to place my money there because I understand what they're doing with it. 
And that's so, so, so incredibly important. And the last thing I'll just say about this and going back to greenwashing, um, we don't really talk about greenwashing at all. It's not, it's not our thing, but I will say this. We looked at the uh, ETF market and there were $116 billion in ESG ETFs. There are only $37 billion of what we consider climate friendly ETFs. I'll just leave it there. Yikes. Um, you know, as, as I think about this question of small entity versus, you know, the largest entities in the world, um, I want to ask the crowd a question, which is 20 years ago, uh, if you look at the S&P 500, the 20 largest companies in the world, how many do you think are still the top 20 in the top 20 today? Anybody? Oh, we got five, three. Guess what? It's zero. Oh. So who are going to be the top 20 companies in 20 years? Who knows? I would bet that they're all going to be climate companies that have genuinely put forward a thesis like the ones that James is talking about that have you know materially relevant revenue coming from deploying climate solutions across the country, across the world. Um, and have figured out how to turn that into a, a profitable business. And ultimately, you know, yes, you know, we, we are small um, and we are mighty. And <laughs> what, what I think uh, is exciting about where we are in this moment in time and being at this conference as well is that, uh, you know, this is the start of an, an amazing series of innovation and, and growth in uh, our economic uh, and our social uh, you know, and, and societal operations. So we're, we're about to explode. There's a fantastic piece from Robinson Meyer in The Atlantic about you know, we're on the cusp of uh, an explosive growth uh, around, around climate and clean energy. And you, know, you, you don't have to be small to do it right, um, but you know, the, the folks that are, are doing it right right now, uh, many of them are small. And we like to think of ourselves as a burr in the sock of the financial industry. You know, we're we're in there agitating. We're in there pushing forward. We're you know we want to we want to make uh, want to make it clear that doing it right uh, doesn't have to be uh, it, it can it can scale it can grow and ultimately you know a conglomerate of of all of us up here on stage probably will emerge. You know, the the next Goldman Sachs will be Green Girl Purse. You know, who knows. <laughs> uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, so without repeating anything, but trying to maybe build off of that a little bit, um, at least somewhat in our space, we see a lot of the incumbent players be kind of trapped in a hard place, what may be considered a classic innovator's dilemma. They are invested in the status quo. They've made a lot of money doing what has been done that got us here. So when they try to sell something to us that is more sustainable, saying that they are the, they're leading this charge, they have to be really careful not to alienate people. And there's several people they're trying not to alienate. There's sort of their classic investments in oil and gas or large companies. There are maybe folks across the political aisle that they're trying to not alienate. Um, there's their current investors that they're saying, we're going to do things radically different, but we're going to continue doing what made you a lot of money as well. And so they're kind of, they're just stuck in a real way. They can make little changes. And we could see the changes being forced on them through new regulations. Those are coming down the line. That might disrupt the whole thing, and I could be wrong on this. But I think that we're going to see a lot of small companies come out who are not stuck, who are like the ones you see up here, 100% pure plays. We have a strong belief. Everyone on the stage believes that we can and need to use money to get to the end result we're all trying to get to right now. Um, and we're either going to be those large companies, as you talked about, we're going to grow there, or we're going to force those companies, we're going to erode enough of the market that those companies are going to be forced to change. Um, I'm actually pretty happy either way. I might be out of a job in one of those cases, but at least I'm on a planet that I want to live on, and that's pretty freaking awesome. So when you're looking at a smaller company and saying, do I want to work with this smaller company? When you work with a smaller company, you are giving them more power. You are giving that reality that they're trying to create, to create an additional weight. You're not just saying that your investment thesis is strong, but you're saying the kind of work where you're fully focused on climate as your theory of change 
and s telling everyone else that they have to sort of get on board with that. So I would say that's the other difference on. Um, I would say at least in banking, it's, I mean, there's, big banks are doing cool projects. Like they're, they're part of a, a financial system that, that is the system. We can't just dissolve the system. But if there's one thing that I think that small banks play the ultimate role in is, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? They, that we, what we do is, is just as important as what we don't do. So while you're, if you're banking at a larger bank, while they are investing in some renewables, they're also, you know, lending a tremendous amount to fossil fuels and payday prison. So like that, if you look at banking as the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding, like no one in this room is going to go on to raise greens platform and, and invest in a private prison or invest in a new oil and gas infrastructure, but you would go and find community projects that you're passionate about. And us as a group of depositors, you know, I, I guarantee probably everybody in this room has a checking account. So us as a group of depositors fund that bank's lending practice, whether we like it or we don't like it. So finding those small banks where you do like their lending practice, they're investing in the communities that you live in is imperative. Um, I mean, we, we're not going to you know, run Chase or Bank of America out of business tomorrow, but we will push them in the right direction the more we divest in from those, or from those financial institutions into financial institutions that are working in the communities that, that you live in and love um, and protect our planet at the same time. Okay, great. So I have um, a bunch more questions, but I want to get a sense from the crowd. Are there a lot of um, questions out there for the panel? Because I want to make sure we get to them. Okay, so so a fair amount. Um, uh, can I ask, I'll ask a quick question here. Um, do any of you in your own personal investing lives, um, where have you put your money aside from some of your own uh, your own solutions, like have you put money in any other green um, investments? Sure, I'll I'll dive in. Um, I'm not allowed to invest in my own projects, huh. uh, or not even my own projects, but projects listed on Raise Green. Um, however, I have built uh, my own sort of stock portfolio. I really want to compare it to what James's ETF has, um, but I. You know, have about 20 stocks in there that are all either, you know, uh, solar or clean energy or uh, uh, other types of uh, te climate-related technologies, um, and and have managed that personally just as a hobby to see how it performs against the market. I'll just say, uh, my kids, we we started to we had this conversation. Clearly, they know what I do, uh, and one day I asked them we're at dinner really sort of a, you know, dad, we just want to eat. Why are you asking us about where our money goes, right? <laughs> but we had this conversation, like, do you want to do, like, good things for the earth or bad things for the earth? Of course we want to do good things for the earth. Um, would you like it to do things for renewable energy? Yeah, renewable energy is great, right? And so we had this conversation, I was like, would you do it enough if we change which bank you have your county? It's like, I don't care. I don't even know which bank we have it in. And so that got me thinking, you know what, maybe we should think about changing. And we use a sustainable platform to find a bank for our kids, right? And so we're transitioning down to um, Green, Green Penny has a little savers program that basically is for climate friendly investing for children with counts under 12. And I think that's a conversation that we can all start to think about having, right? Um, and it's important, right? And, and it allows us to think about sort of the few dollars that I give them that I put into their account that they never actually see, they're never actually touching, but it allows them to, uh, to, to attach to sort of like our dollars are doing something really, really good. And I'm now invested in a way that I otherwise might not have been. And so for our family, we've started to think about and, 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 and think about all the different ways that we can utilize our dollars in a ways to be much more climate aligned. It's my job, but it's also my choice as one of us who are just out here trying to make this place a little bit better. Anyone else? Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll go because I'm always on the lookout for, um, uh, you know, good options for um, impact in my own investments, the small as they are. Um, but one that I really like is called Steward. It's a crowdfunding site. They used to call themselves crowd farming, but they, um, you can invest in small, sustainable farms around the country, and I think they're 
a little bit outside the country as well. Um, and, you know, earn a nice, um, you know, it's generally a loan, so you might get six, seven, eight percent back. Um, but then they also started a fund, so you can just put money in their fund and it goes across all of the, um, you know, small family run sustainable farms that are, are um, uh, raising money on the site. So that's a nice one, steward. Okay, so um, let's open it up to some questions from the audience and then we can come back and wrap up here. Um, oh, okay. Do you want to pick? Or? Do you want me to pick? Okay. Um, <laughs> right here. Hi, I'm Clint Wilder. I'm with Clean Edge. We operate uh, four clean tech stock indexes in partnership with NASDAQ. Um, Anti ESG movement seems to be gaining momentum, which is causing at least some momentum in the anti-anti-ESG <laughs> movement. <laughs> um, I, I read the other day that three states have bills that uh, would forbid the state from doing uh, business with insurance companies who, you know, use ESG factors, which is sort of the, the whole point of insurance. But anyway, uh, your take, how, how big of a, of a threat are we, are we seeing here? I can't actually speak to the political side, but I do want to talk about um, that all of these financial institutions, including insurance, are required to take in material risk. And trying to say that environmental isn't material risk is going to become more and more ridiculous, particularly when you look at things like insurance. Not taking into climate is like not taking in their core business into account when doing their core business. So I think it's going to I don't know where that ends up, but trying to force through laws that undermine the ability to do the thing that they, these people who are against it still want them to do is going to eventually become impossible. So I, I think some of it will hit against that reality. Um, and I hope sooner rather than later, well, I, I don't hope anyone is hurt by what's going to happen, but it, it will. And so I think it's happening it sooner will sort of free up us to get sort of beyond this, this what seems like a very political. Yeah, I mean, insurance is kind of extreme. Sure, but you know, take take any company I invest in. If you have projects that exist in the yeah. physical world, they are going to be affected by things. If you have a server farm that can get flooded, you have you know physical infrastructure that's the same is true. You're going to be experiencing more severe heat. You're not going to have the same kind of uh, labor that you would expect to have. You're going to be experiencing extreme weather events. You can't rely on the same infrastructure of transportation that you did before. Like, no matter how you look at it, the physical realities of the world will eventually show that these are real risks. So we, we already see this happening, and I think the military is a really good example of how this played out in the past. Like, yes, the military was not allowed to say the words climate change. Like, it was politically taboo. You could not talk about it. But I guarantee you, we know, we have reports that everybody in the military was talking about sea level rise. They were talking about the risks from people mi doing mass migration movements. They were discussing these risks, and they just had different ways of talking about it. Mm -hmm. So if this continues, I think what happens is we start creating a secret language that allows us to discuss the reality <laughs> without discussing the reality. Yeah, there are a lot of proposals to actually change the name of ESG to something else for that very reason. Um, I have somebody from the back. I don't have my glasses on. The, yes. Oh, the, the, um, He's very standing up. waving in the back. <laughs> Thank you. First off, just I've had a wonderful time listening to you guys. It's been super informative. And as someone who is eventually going to start investing in like 401 ks and I now have a lot of tools that I can use, so I appreciate it. Um, my question is for James and Franz. So uh, I, I'm in the water innovation space, and I know that you have some experience in that space. And uh, I know that it's extremely difficult to provide local impact with scalable investments um, when you're trying to solve particularly like a water challenge where a lot of the issues are localized. Um, and you're trying to solve a localized problem. It makes it difficult to create some sort of company that can scale across non-localized problems. So I'm wondering if you guys uh, have any thoughts on where that might go and some maybe innovative like financing mechanisms that might be able to be useful like what you're doing with Raising Green or similar kind of entities or just your general thoughts on that. Thanks. Oh, yeah, um, good one. So, um, you know, the, I, I don't know how many of y'all caught Ali Zaidi's talk, the National Climate Advisor, last night. He talked about uh, people places and projects as being, you know, their sort of theory of uh, how to uh, 
go about implementing climate policy in an equitable way. You know, we, we I feel like, front run them on that for a while, but um, we, we, if you're thinking about like a localized water related challenge, I don't know if it's, you know, stormwater infrastructure or drinking water or, or uh, you know, wastewater runoff, what have you. Um, I think that, um, you know, w one vision I, I was trying to share yesterday in, in one of the roundtables was I think we need more people getting into rooms, like local locally, and, and putting together uh, their various experiences, capabilities, and motivations, and literally designing place-based solutions for communities uh, and then going out and finding where they can get capital. And that is ultimately, you know, one side of the Raise Green Marketplace. You know, we have a pipeline of, uh, of a, about $100 million of, of projects that have come to us and said, hey, we, we want to raise money for our startup or for our individual project. And uh, ultimately, like, they have to, you know, the, the initiative has to come from communities because they're, you know, the, the best situated to know what the answers are. Um, but we can provide tools, we can provide structuring, you know, we can provide, uh, you know, templates for legal incorporation um, so that you can go out and issue securities in an SEC and FINRA compliant way and raise the money uh, from the general public. You know, anybody can invest as little as $100 um, and, and ultimately, you know, we're just a tool in the toolbox. Uh, we'd love to be used in, in that manner. I just called myself a tool, but. <laughs> Smart tool. I want to call on Useful. the woman and you on the, um, yeah, there we go. Hello, my name is Carrie Browder. I'm with Prime Coalition, and um, we invest in early stage startups. Um, and one thing we actually have for our staff is like, they, they don't have the capital to even consider being a venture capitalist. So we wanna find ways to provide opportunities for those of our staff who are really interested in investing in climate and didn't know how. So I don't know if this is like recorded for the public, but I'd love to just share this whole thing with our team. Um, my question is both in what I see in our staff and in some of our philanthropists who invest in us, that there's still some concern about like an impending recession and whether or not you should put your capital and in investments versus um, like high yield savings accounts, which have gone down because of the economics. I'm just wondering from your perspective, being different types of banks and not being big banks, are there savings opportunities that allows you to invest in climate and not necessarily put all your eggs in the uh, capital markets? Thank you. Um, I mean, Climate First Bank, I would say as a community bank, we probably have some of the highest interest rates on high yield savings and CD certificate deposit accounts. So um, like I would say, um, if you probably go on Ask Sustainable, you report interest rates too. Yes, we do. Right. So yes, do. Um, I would say go on Ask Sustainable and find a values aligned bank either in your neighborhood or that you really align with. If it's Climate First Bank, we would love to have you. But and, and see what's out there. I mean, we I don't know if we actually give you our rates because they've been changing so much because as the Fed has increased rates, we've increased rates um, since we're a relatively new bank. But there's, I think you'll find so many more options for like safe nest eggs with FDIC insured banks that will align with your values that will fund climate friendly projects. And so yes, we do update rates and our team, research team, um, he probably won't see it, Washika well, Med on our team is fabulous and so all the information and data that we have on our site is because of him and the team that works with him and so we update rates i think monthly because we understand that they're changing and but that's part of the information that we try to have stale information is not useful information so if you go to a place and realize that the information has like been updated like half a year ago you're never going to come back right so that's not actionable information to figure out something that you want to do now so we try our best to get as much real live data as we possibly can. And the other thing is we say is like also on Ask Sustainable, there are some other products that are from uh, credit unions as well as CDFIs, impact notes. 
Um, so there's a whole variety of them on there as well that are sort of higher yielding. They're non-FDI insured. Most of them are not FDI insured, but many of them have longer track records in sort of providing the type of investments that you know you or some of your employees or other uh, 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 funders may be interested in. Once again, this is not advice. This is just information related to what is on the particular platform. And actually, a lot of these um, private, like Franz, what you're doing, and a, a lot of things on Trenton's site are um, non-correlated with the markets, which is nice. Thank you. I thought you were not going to call me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Alex Moreira with the Amazon Chamber uh, in, in Miami. Amazon as in Amazon Forest, not the Amazon Company. And um, delighted to, uh, it's, it's been a great panel, and delighted to know that there are serious people working uh, on the plumbing of sustainable finance, because that's one of the bottlenecks. Uh, the plumbing between capital seekers and capital providers. So uh, there's a lot being done here in that sense. Um, but it has long been my theory that solving the climate crisis is not necessarily an issue of capital availability. It's an issue of the plumbing of it, and it's an issue of uh, being able to get bankable projects. It's an issue of bankability, as a matter of fact. Um, so what side, if any, of your activity tries to work on that aspect of it, making sure or helping those projects become bankable so that they can receive investments? Yeah, um, I, I can definitely speak to that. So uh, we started Raise Green in 2018 uh, with a, a core focus on commercial and industrial scale solar, 50 kilowatt projects up to 5 megawatt. Um, and, and we did that because there was a, a large inefficiency in that market. It still somewhat exists today, although there's a lot of innovation trying to attack it and unlock those types of, uh, you know, de-risk de the investments um, as well as, uh, you know, make them um, in, a, in more packaged ways, et cetera. Um, so we spent probably two years of our, uh, <laughs> of our blood, sweat, and tears uh, working with community developers to, you know, who, amateur developers who wanted, had a dream of, look, I, I want to uh, become a solar developer. I, I see a rooftop over there and I want to put solar on it. And we worked to give them the tools to do that. And we even took our own customer journey by developing the first two fully equity crowdfunded solar projects in the country on a rooftop of a homeless shelter in New Haven, Connecticut that are now owned by 126 crowd investors. Um, so we, and then we ran an accelerator program working again with that uh, type of long tail developer to give them the tools and templates. And, and what it comes down to, I think project readiness is you know, the, the, uh, the, the most critical component, I think, of mobilizing what we have to do to deploy IRA money, what we have to do to truly reach scale at, at in this, uh, this era. So, um, you know, we, we still provide some of that technical assistance. There's a community power accelerator that uh, DOE has just launched, uh, which we were happy to work on. Actually, the Sustainable Capital, Capital Advisor folks uh, worked on that as well. Um, so mobilizing that technical assistance is vital to, be, to get projects and, and companies into a place where they are bankable, um, and, and you're so right. Um, you know, it's, it's not a glut of capital right now, or it's not a, a dearth of capital right now. Um, it is a dearth of bankable projects. And, you know, if everyone in this room developed a 100 kilowatt solar array, um, we could probably power all of Miami. Well, that is very good actionable advice. Um, we are at time, although I don't think there's anything after this if we <laughs> people want to stay a little bit longer. But I did want to ask um, the panel in conclusion to um, uh, each maybe give some advice. Like what advice would you give individuals or families who are kind of new um, to this space? How should they start? Um, you know, what would your advice be in this area? Go first. 
Oh, I keep forgetting you don't have to. Um, I'll start with the most simple thing that, like I said earlier, that I'm sure every single person in this room has a checking account. Um, to go on to Ask Sustainable, find a bank that aligns with your values and transition your deposit accounts. Um, I mean, typically, I mean, banks run like an 80 to 90 percent loan to deposit ratio. So, I mean, every dollar you deposit essentially funds, um, you know, 80 percent of a loan. So, um, that's that's such an important stream of just funding the types of um, infrastructure and projects that we want to see. I know it's hard. Banking, switching your banking is something that nobody wants to do. You're going to have to like call your employer and like change your direct deposit and like remember your Netflix password and like change where that comes out of. Like it's a it's not easy, but like once it's done, it's done and you you have that peace of mind knowing that your your deposit dollars are funding the future that you all want to see. Um, there's a ton of awesome resources online. <laughs> for example, um, and we have some resources on our website as well. So you start with your deposits on your on your banking. Maybe you switch over your credit card, and maybe after that you start looking at your um, investments. And if that's a 401k, pressure your company to offer better options. And if it's through an individual investment account, look at what's out there. Find what works for you, what helps you meet your financial goals, but that's also putting your dollars in alignment with the kind of world you want to see. Can I, can I just say something super quick? There is a, um, we're working on something called like the Pledge for Systemic Change in which we're providing resources for people to provide a letter to their HR department to say like, hey, where our 401k is matters. Um, so we are working on like templates and letters and stuff of how to encourage employers to make those decisions. So um, if anybody's interested in those resources, um, they're almost done, but I'm happy to share with anybody. Excellent, that, that was gonna be my point as well, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, so uh, at the beginning of this, I think James dropped a stat that you know we need a roughly $5 trillion per year flowing globally to tackle the climate crisis. Uh, last year, we were at about $800 billion, uh, so we have a long way to go. However, um, there is about $5 trillion in checkable deposits in banks like Lauren's. Uh, just in the U.S., according to Bloomberg, in savings or checking accounts earning very low rates. So um, this is not investment advice, but mobilizing that money and putting it into uh, the hands of innovation and development and into the ground in the form of uh, clean energy all across the country um, would be immensely powerful. Uh, we created Raise Green to empower you to do that. Uh, please check out our, our investment round as well, our community round. We'd love to have you all be owners of the company and help us uh, continue to, uh, drawing on Trenton stats, uh, provide more than 1,000 pounds of CO2 emission reduction per $100 invested on our marketplace. Where is your community round, Franz? Ah, it's uh, wefunder.com slash raise green. All right, and, and I'll just, uh, in here, we've been, this is at Aspen, so we're told to be hopeful, and actually, uh, <laughs> No, no, we're going to be hopeful here. But but one of the good things about being on this particular panel is we've had a conversation amongst ourselves is that uh, we're, there, is this con, uh, there is this stream of consciousness that we have. And so part of what Franz just mentioned were some of my final stats, right? So uh, on ASS, basically our tagline at Sustainable is there's change in your pocket. That's the first thing I'll say. Uh, that if you're talking to someone who's trying to figure it out, there's change, right? That change can be big change, can be small change. Everyone's pocket looks different. But whatever it is that you might have and whatever amount can be used to do something to benefit this place that we share, right? So we have agency. Uh, we have an ability to, to, to make a change. So taking in some other numbers that we have, I want to ask Sustainable right now, there is $11 billion in deposit products, right? $11 billion, $11 billion. And that's checking savings, money market CDs. In the U.S. alone, there's 190, or there's almost 20 trillion dollars in deposit products. We have 11 and a half billion of climate-friendly products. There's 20 trillion. That's less than one percent. We have some work to do. So let's just say, if we did one trillion of, I mean, just one percent, just one percent, right? 1% basically translates if we took all people 21 to 40 in the country and said, let's just get to 1% of climate-friendly investments, that's 
$2,200 a person, right? So if we said 2%, $4,400, all right? Let's push it to 5% and open up to everyone older than 21. That's $4,000 per person to get at 5%, which is roughly a trillion dollars. And so, yes, that's a lot of money, right? Yes, I know that the median, uh, the, 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 the median um, amount in an account is $5,000, right? But there is possibilities of how we think about sort of all the dollars that we have can really be used towards something. In my other job, I spend a lot of time thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act and all the wonderful stuff that you'll hear probably tonight from Vice President and yesterday from Ali Zaidi. And we're all clamoring around for it. There's a whole lot of competition for $20 billion. We could do a trillion just with us. So while we love the fights in Washington, we love all those other things, just remember there's always change in your pocket and we can be that change that is necessary to bring the dollars into the places we can be directed into projects that have a direct change in the communities that we serve and the communities that we're part of. So that, that's my hopeful bit here in Aspen. Yeah. Well said. That's a great place to end. Um, I just want to add one quick thing, too. Um, we didn't have time to get into it, but um, you can never look at climate in a vacuum, right? It's interconnected with environmental justice, racial justice, gender issues, you know, clean water, so many other things. So um, where possible, it's nice to see if you can hit some of those other things with with your investment. And if you're a professional, um, I would suggest reading Impact Alpha because we cover, um, you know, we're 100% focused on impact investment and there is so much happening in that world um, if you are an institutional investor or an accredited investor. Um, so that that's also a very good resource. <laughs>